When we design a shaft, we place bearings at each end of the shaft to constrain the radial motion but allow for axial rotation. That's an important part of machine element design. We have to allow for that free rotation. And there are many choices of bearing that we can use. In this particular lecture, we're going to start off with rolling contact bearing. This is a drawing of a shaft, which I've placed a coordinate system on. An XY coordinate system is shown here. And that shaft has steps in it that are associated with snap ring grooves, with bearings. This is bearing A on the left side. We have bearing B on the right side. We have shoulders that we press the bearings up against. And we have gears three and four also on this shaft. Now, in the past, we've talked about how we select the diameter of this shaft to make sure that the shaft has an infinite life. Now we want to talk about how we select bearings that allow for the free rotation of the shaft about, in this case, the x-axis, so it can rotate freely, but is constrained from motion in the y and z directions or in the radial directions, and also constrained from any lateral motion back and forth. So we have to select bearings to do this. There are many choices of bearings. We can use fluid bearings. We can use magnetic bearings. We can simply use friction bushings we can use rolling contact bearings. We are going to be focusing first on rolling contact bearings. And the first question that you might ask about them is how do we select the appropriate bearings for the given application? Well, we find those by first solving the statics problem. And that is we have to determine the forces that these bearings at A and at B must carry. So we're gonna find the net radial force and we are going to choose our bearings to be able to accommodate that net radial force for a given lifetime. Now we have already mentioned that we're going to be using rolling contact bearings and that's going to involve a rolling element, in this case a sphere or a ball bearing, and that ball is held in place using a cage that keeps each of the spheres separate inside the bearing. The shaft fits through the bore, the shaft fits through the bore, as shown here, and you have a slight press fit. You'll notice that there is a corner radius that accommodates the shoulder on the shaft so that you don't enhance the stress concentration factor in the shaft. So this inner ring is called the inner race. The outer ring is the outer race, and the balls inside between the inner and outer race roll as the shaft rotates inside along the bore axis. So what causes causes failure in these things is rolling contact. If you were to look at any particular ball in this bearing, it is sitting in a race. It has both an inner and an outer race. And as you apply load, if this is the axis of the shaft, as you apply a radial load to that shaft, that radial load is transferred through rolling contact in the sphere. And so there is a contact stress at the inner race and a contact stress at the outer race. So what causes failure is something called contact fatigue. And eventually, as the ball rolls over the inner or outer race a large number of times, that contact stress distribution initiates subsurface cracks that propagate to the surface and spall off. So if I were to just look at a cross section of the sphere in contact with the race, as we press the sphere into the race, the maximum shear stress stress occurs below the surface. Remember, this sphere flattens out and it creates a contact stress distribution with a maximum shear that is below the surface by some distance. And eventually, as this ball moves, rolls across the race, it causes cyclic slip back and forth, which initiates a crack. The crack propagates to the surface and a little chip flies out, and that is called a spall, and that is what eventually leads to failure of the bearing. There are many different types of ball bearings, as shown in this figure right here. This is figure 11.2 from the Shigley textbook, so we borrow Shigley's work a lot. And this shows a deep groove ball bearing. Deep groove, what does that mean? There's a pretty large groove in the races, and that means that in addition to being able to handle radial load, this can also handle some axial 
low. This is an example of what's called a filling notch. It's wider on one side than the other, which allows you to load a larger number of balls into the bearing. The greater number of rolling elements you have in there, the greater the load sharing, and so the longer that thing should last. An angular contact ball bearing is really well designed for specific axial loading. These are shielded so that you keep them clean. These are shielded and sealed. This is what's called an external self-aligning, which allows for the shaft to have a change in slope by some amount theta, and the bearings will still align. That's an important thing. Double row just increases the radial load that the bearing can handle because now you're distributing that load over more than one sphere in the contact area. And this is a self-aligning bearing again, which allows for misalignment or slight angular rotations of the bore shaft. If we have a shaft vertically, then this is a thrust bearing, which allows for rotation around the axis. And this is a self-aligning thrust bearing. Many different types of bearings out there. In addition to spherical or ball bearings, there are other types of roller bearings out there. There's something called the straight cylindrical roller bearing, which is shown in figure A. Again, this is from the Shigley textbook. The axis of the shaft, that is the axis of rotation, is aligned horizontally in this case. And what do you get from this is in a straight cylindrical roller bearing, you can see that you get a much larger area of contact. And so a straight cylindrical roller will be able to handle larger radial loads than a ball bearing. This is a spherical roller in figure B, which is angled so that it can handle fairly large axial loads. This is a pure thrust bearing right here in C, which is designed to handle axial loads. If you don't have a lot of space, you can use very thin cylinders to handle a load, and those are called needle bearings. If you have significant radial and axial loads, you can use tapered roller bearings as shown in E and F. The advantage of roller bearings is they have much larger contact areas, and so they can handle much larger radial loads, and if you taper them, they can handle much larger axial loads than can equivalent ball bearings. Now let's go back to ball bearings and try to work out how the lifetime of a ball bearing is related to the load. So the radial load is related to the number of rotations, the lifetime of the bearing through a power law, the load is related to one over the lifetime raised to the power one over A. And so if we take the force, the radial load that we're applying and multiply it by the number of rotations to the one over A, we have a constant. Now, because we wanna do design, a lot of experiments were conducted on both roller and ball bearings, and they found that the power A is equal to three for ball bearings and 10 thirds for roller bearings. So that's a a standard approach that is used. If we take the logarithm of each side, logarithm of the radial load is related to the logarithm of the number of rotations through a negative exponent, one over A. Now, bearing companies rate their bearings for load and lifetime. The lifetime that they use is on the order of 10 to the 6 cycles. Remember, that's in fatigue what we have a tendency to call infinite life. And that life is referred to as the L10 lifetime of a bearing, which means that for a given radial load, 90% of the bearings at that radial load will last over 1 times 10 to the 6 cycles. The radial load is given a special name as well. It is called the C10 load, and C10 is the radial load for 10 to the 6th rotations with a reliability of 90 percent. What do we do with that? It turns out that all of the bearing companies provide lists of C10 ratings, and remember those are always related to 10 to the 6th rotations or 10 to the 6 full cycles of loading. And so we imagine the following. We take a look at the log radial load log lifetime plot and we get this simple linear relationship, this negative 1 over a slope here. And so if we have a particular L10 value that we've located on this curve and it has associated with it a 
factory C10 radial load that will give you 90% reliability for 10 to the 6 cycles, then if you want the same reliability, then you can choose a design load and an associated design lifetime off of that chart. And what we know is that the design load times that design lifetime raised to the power 1 over A will be equal to C10 times L10 to the power 1 over A. So that means for a given design load and a given expressed lifetime, we can select a C10 value by simply solving for this design load, design lifetime, L10 lifetime, all to the power 1 over A. So what this does is, given our chosen radial design loads and the number of rotations we want our particular shaft to last, we can then calculate a C10 value that we can use to search the bearing selection tables for a given manufacturer. So this provides a target C10 value to search the manufacturer's tables for available bearings. To select those bearings, you're going to need to know what your shaft diameter is. You're going to need a clearance to be able to mount them on the shaft. And then you're going to want to know from statics what the design loads are. And from your design choices, what your design lifetime is. You calculate a C10 and you look up the possibilities. You always choose a bearing with a C10 value greater than your candidate value. So the steps that you must take in order to do bearing selection include first solving the statics problem to find the bearing forces on each side of the shaft. You have to find the net radial load. That net radial load becomes your design radial load. From that design radial load and your chosen design lifetime, you find a C10 value, and then you use that candidate C10 value to go search for the t through the bearing selection tables and find a bearing that will work for your particular shaft. You can then modify the calculations to increase the reliability and to account for axial loads, but that's something we're gonna do in the next lecture. It's important to note that when you are looking at these load lifetime plots, that we associate an L10 lifetime with a C10 load. And so this line here is for a given reliability. And the reliability of the C10 values is 90%. That means that any pair on this curve. So if we come out here to some other lifetime, L, it will have an associated radial load, FR, or that radial load, it will have a 90% reliability of achieving that particular lifetime. So these are ordered pairs here. These are L, F, R ordered pairs. And if you are trying to move along that curve, you're gonna notice something. So this C10, L10, ordered pair here is the catalog rated value for 90% reliability. If you want to increase the lifetime, you have to decrease the radial load. So as you move down this curve, you are increasing lifetime, but you are also decreasing the allowable radial load. Now this is an example of a catalog table. It's from the textbook again, but it shows the old way of doing things where you would find a C10 value and then using that C10 value, you would search the table for a C10 value that would work for you. And you would also then see if you could get that C10 value at the appropriate shaft diameter and with enough clearance to fit into your space where you want to put the shaft and do your bearing selection. It was harder. That's the old way. Now you go straight to the bearing manufacturer's website. You enter your shaft dimensions. You enter your shaft loads and it will choose a bearing for you. Now, the next thing that we need to talk about is rotations versus hours. All of this early work in lifetimes is done using number of rotations. So LD is the design number of rotations. But oftentimes in rotating machinery, we don't want it in rotations. We want a lifetime in hours. So we have to convert a lifetime in hours to a number of rotations in order to be able to exploit the power law relationship that tells us that our design load times our design lifetime to the one over a power is going to be equal to C10 
times L10 to the 1 over A power. Well, we're really trying to find C10, so we're going to rearrange this so that we get our ratio of design lifetime to L10 lifetime to the 1 over A using our design radial loads and our design lifetimes. Well, if we're giving given a lifetime in hours, we can convert our lifetime in hours to a number of rotations by taking that lifetime in hours, multiplying it by the RPM, and there are 60 minutes per hour. So our C10 value is simply our radial load times our lifetime in hours, our RPMs times 60, that's divided by the L10 value for the given manufacturer. I need to let you know that this L10 value can vary with manufacturer, but it's always something times 10 to the sixth. And we choose this exponent, A is equal to three for ball bearings. So let's do a quick example and sort out how we would search for an SKF bearing, which has L10 lifetimes in millions of revolutions. We have a desired lifetime LD of 5,000 hours at 1,725 RPM. Our radial load, our design radial load, it turns out is 400 pounds. And our reliability is 90%. So that means we can use this the L10 value given by the manufacturer and the C10 value that's directly associated with that. So our target C10 value is going to be equal to, again, our design radial load times our hours times N times 60 divided by 10 to the sixth, all to the one over A, where A is equal to three in this case because we're looking for a ball bearing. So our C10 value is gonna be 400 pounds times 5,000 hours times 1,725 RPM times 60, all of that divided by one times 10 to the sixth and raised to the power one third. If we work that out, of 3,211 pound force, but SKF being a European country doesn't do it that way. Uh, they do it in kilonewtons, so we have to multiply this by 4.448 newtons per pound force, and that gives us a C10 value of 14.3 kilonewtons.